I'll introduce you to the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Alex Persa from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne. So Alex is uh, an assistant professor at the EPFL Global Health Institute and uh, the Institute, of, uh, Institute for Bioengineering in Lausanne. And uh, in, in his lab, they combine engineering and uh, bio, uh, micro microbiological approaches to understand how bacteria sense, respond to, and adapt to their mechanical environment. And his multidisciplinary approach and, uh, and novel technologies provide a deeper understanding of microbial physiology, ecology, and infectious diseases. And the title of the talk is Investigating Bacterial Mechanobiology with ISCAT. Please. Thank you, Antti, for the introduction, and thank you very much for being here after the party. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, in particular Guillaume, I don't know where he is, but uh, uh, for organizing this uh, terrific conference. It's been a, it's been a blast. Uh, so ironically, today I was going to give you a talk in person, but my, for technical reason, I have to give my slides on Zoom. And it's ironic because I'm going to have to tell you about uh, uh, ISCAD, which increases temporal resolution, but all the movies are going to be messed up in temporal resolution due to the, 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 the broadcasting. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more first about uh, uh, the, the topics that are actually uh, studied in my lab. We investigate the mechanobiology of bacteria, uh, which comes from a naive, actually, a, a view of these uh, microorganisms. So bacteria in the wild are actually colonizing all types of surface on Earth. There's not very many places where you don't find bacteria. Uh, and they're very much important in the context of infection, for example, in the context of our lungs or in our intestines, but also in, in, uh, in freshwater environments. But for 150 slash 200 years, we've been studying in microbiology lab these microorganisms in a very stereotypical way on agar plates and petri dishes. But this uh, actually overlooks the complexity of their natural environment. For example, uh, uh, a complex lung tissue is totally different than uh, the typical agar plate. And so my lab is actually trying to solve this. And to, uh, to solve this, we actually do two things. We do a lot of engineering where we try to develop new culture uh, platforms to actually better mimic the natural environment of these microbes uh, and actually develop new assays and including microscopy to actually test their mechanical behavior and then also to characterize the contribution of mechanics which are completely overlooked from microbiology studies in regulating the physiology and behavior of these bacteria. So this picture is from, taken from, uh, uh, it's a street art from uh, San Francisco. Uh, it really embodies very well probably uh, uh, how you guys feel about microscopy. You want to see inside, but when I saw this, I, I was thinking, this is exactly how I feel. It expresses many aspects of what we want to see. We want to see inside this organism during infection, for example. We want to see inside bacteria as well. But very many times, we want to adapt the technique and, uh, d depending on the type of application. For example, I wonder what this guy is actually seeing with this stereo microscope. So this philosophy led us to actually develop many different types of tools, uh, not only microscopes, but trying to rebuild the sample around the microscope. Uh, for example, we're trying to develop new systems to actually perform live visualization of infections, not in full organism, but in organoids, because we think it's, it's the actual only way to actually have very precise single cell level resolution image of, uh, of these infectious processes. So what you're looking at here is a tube-shaped lung organoid, which is infected by a, uh, uh, what we call an opportunistic pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And we try to study how it behaves in this context, it's a realistic context that really very much resembles the lung, and it actually attaches to different surfaces on the lung, including what we call mucus, which is a hydrogel layer that makes the sputum that you essentially sneeze, and this surface is very important in the process of infection. And with this, we can read out some aspects of bacterial physiology. Uh, we're looking at biofilm formation, for example, this on, on the right of the picture here. So these biofilms are actually generated on, 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 uh, on different types of surfaces with different types of stiffness. And we're trying to make sense of how the bacteria perceive these different sur surfaces. Uh, this brings us to uh, problems that are related to what we call mechanosensing, so force sensing uh, in organisms. So for mechanosensing in eukaryotes is actually quite well established. We know, for example, that 
uh, eukaryotic cells can pull on the substrate, as you saw in the previous uh, uh, presentation. Uh, they can actually sense the st stiffness of the substrate. In bacteria, it's a little less clear. We know that they can sense the chemistry of their environment, but we don't know much about how, whether and how they can actually sense the mechanics of the environment. So one of the important questions my lab is actually asking is whether and how bacteria can actually sense uh, uh, actively the, the, the mechanics of its environment. Uh, and to do this, we, uh, we use both uh, uh, engineering, physics, and uh, microbiology and genetics to actually understand the different pieces that are actually making up this mechanosensory system. So to, in order to make sense, a bacterium, which is uh, essentially this single cell, that cell that's very stiff, has uh, many components that are mechanically interacting with the environment, including uh, flagellum, which is well known, this rotary filament that's actually propelling the cell in swimming, and maybe the less well-known pili. And pili are, uh, are, are polymers that we're studying a lot in the lab. Uh, these pili are actually uh, useful for bacteria in many different configurations. Uh, in many, uh, for many different functions, which include mainly uh, what we call twitching motility, uh, which is a surface-specific motility system, and we discovered that actually these pili are also helping the cells mechanosense surfaces, so they really pull on surfaces using these elements. So I'm going to tell you little by little more about this and how we're actually using microscopy to understand uh, this, uh, this pili. Uh, this is a very slow-mo of uh, bacteria moving <laughs> uh, onto a surface uh, using uh, what we call twitching motility, wherein the bacteria actually use these filaments to, that they, they extend, attach onto the surface, retract actively in, back into the cell to pull themselves and really uh, 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 propel themselves on the surface. Uh, if the movie was at the right resolution, you would really see these very s smooth trajectories of uh, bacteria. So how do they uh, actually generate force? They have multiple molecular motors, one of which actually polymerize the protein subunit at the base of the pillars, and two others that are actually depolymerizing these subunits to retract the filaments. And then supposedly, uh, we actually don't know whether this, we didn't know whether this was happening, they extend, attach the pillars, retract, pull themselves, and then go through cycles of this extension retraction to essentially propel themselves. We also know that this process is useful for the cells to sense the surface. So they sense, essentially, that their pili are attached, and they sense the tension in this pili. So we have many questions, actually, uh, we had many questions about this pili. Do they actually know when they are extending or retracting? So do they coordinate these two uh, uh, movements? Uh, where are they going? Uh, this is a simple question, like we, we saw in the movies, that they're kind of all over the place. Uh, and then is there any uh, uh, emerging group behavior from these uh, trajectories? So to understand why we need that, uh, uh, advanced microscopy uh, to visualize the, the, the pilos, I'm going to tell you a little bit more using this movie how the, the pilos is actually being made. So you have these monomers that are floating around in the membrane of the bacterium that are encountering an assembly machinery here. It's a pore that spans the cell envelope. And then you have cytoplasmic uh, uh, motors that are essentially polymerizing this these protein subunits into a filament, it's a helical filament. And this helical filament is therefore being extruded through the pore complex here. Uh, this is actually happening very fast. You get thousands of monomers added onto the, the, the filament per second. And then this extrusion is generating the, the pilus uh, itself. However, you, when you look at this bacteria under the microscope, just with a si simple face contrast microscope, uh, or even bright field, what you see is just the cell body. So we know these filaments are outside the cell. For example, the pili are there, also the flagellum, which is um, uh, much more uh, 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 well known. The cells are swimming, we know they have it, but we can't see it. Uh, so why is that? Well, the, the, the simple answer is that they, they're too small to be, uh, to be seen with a regular uh, uh, microscopy modality. They're too small, they're about six nanometers in width. Uh, and uh, at the same time, they actually are being extruded, maybe very close from the surface, so maybe the signal from, from the cell body is overwhelming uh, uh, so that we cannot visualize it. However, we can see these things very well with electron microscopy, but we're in a light microscopy uh, uh, conference, so I'm not going to tell you about the, the work on structure we do. Uh, but, you know, they scatter, uh, and uh, uh, the fluorescence is possible, 
but what you can appreciate is that this pore here is a very tight space in which the pillars must, must uh, fit. And so if you conjugate, it, it's impossible to conjugate the GFP onto there. Uh, the pillars will not extract, extend anymore. Uh, and some uh, people have managed to uh, 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 perform mutations of the pilin subunit, the monomer, so that they could essentially conjugate uh, uh, alexas onto it. So uh, th this is actually doable, but very short-lived and very invasive and disruptive to the pillars. So we can take pictures like this, but it doesn't last a long time. Uh, so we try to think a little bit more about how to do uh, this. These pili outside the cell, they should scatter photons, so how do we reveal this? Uh, so I'm going to get to interferometric scattering microscopy, and I scat. Uh, this was a technique that was pioneered by uh, the lab of Vaid Sandohar. Uh, and uh, very recently, maybe in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of efforts in applying uh, ISCAT to uh, biology. And then the, the, the lab of Philip Kukura at Oxford started publishing a few papers about visualizing uh, biological motors and polymers. Uh, and what was very striking is that they had the ability with ISCAT to actually visualize actin filaments, which are five nanometer in width. This was exactly the, the, the type of uh, dimensions we were looking at with the PILI. So we contacted Philip and we said, we want to try this together. Uh, and uh, essentially, he told us a little bit more about ISCAT and how this works because uh, we weren't specialists at the time. Uh, but the, this is a, the basics, these are the basics of ISCAT. You have your sample on the cover slip. You're, uh, you're, you're shining a laser light onto the sample. Uh, there's some reflection of the light. This will be a reference light, so the reflection from the first co cover, the light hitting the cover slip. And then the light that's transmitted is being scattered by the sample, and some of the scattered light is coming back towards the detection objective. And you're essentially taking the interference signal between these two different reference and scattered light. Uh, so the way this works is that you actually have uh, uh, ultimately an interference term uh, coming out of uh, your signal. This interference term scales as the radius of the particle, the size of the particle to the power of one instead of two, which really makes it uh, much more interesting to improve the signal of small scatterers. So you win a lot uh, uh, by ISCAT by to, to look at the very small particles. And that's why with this you have the ability to visualize single proteins. So Philip's lab is really developing uh, uh, ISCAT to uh, visualize proteins and actually not only visualize, but to measure their mass. I'm not going to go the, into the details of this. Uh, there's a, even a commercial product now on, on this. Uh, but this uh, system can take pictures of proteins, uh, determine uh, the molecular weight of protein complex with quite high resolution, uh, and it's becoming increasingly popular. So this is how it works in practice for live cells. So we have a different system than the, than the typical system for, for protein mass photometry. Uh, the main uh, uh, differences are, of course, the, the incident light. We're trying to uh, not be too phototoxic because there's still a lot of light shining on the cell. So we're using uh, high wavelength uh, uh, visible laser, and we had to change the autofocus as well. Uh, but there's a lot of the, of the magic is coming at the sample preparation uh, side, uh, which uh, is, a, is essentially uh, 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 an aspect that we're trying to, uh, to optimize so that the bacteria stays happy for a long time under the ISCAT illumination. Okay, so now let's go back to our pili. This is uh, the bacterium under the bright field uh, uh, channel of our ISCAT. Uh, and at the same time, if you look at it under the ISCAT, this is what you see. Totally different uh, picture. Uh, so here, this looks like a qu quite of a static cell, but the same cell at the same time actually has many features that you can uh, probably appreciate okay here. Uh, the cell body scatters a lot, so we get a very strong signal even with artifacts. And then you still see filaments that are extending from the cell surface. So these dynamic filaments here are the pili, and this filament in the back here is actually a flagellum that's rotating much more quickly than actually what you're seeing on this movie. Uh, and then we can actually do this for a long time. So this is a, a, a low temporal <laughs> resolution rendering of the, the nice movie we have in our publication. Uh, but you can see that this is a, a pseudomonas bacterium standing up on the surface and extending the pili uh, uh, radially uh, from its cell surface. Uh, and these uh, movies are actually, uh, I would say, quite stunning because this is completely label-free, so we can actually uh, uh, the cells are so happy compared to any other techniques we've, we've used before uh, that uh, this is actually changing the game in, in the way we perceive the, the surface structure of bacteria. 
So we've applied this uh, eye scan microscopy to many different uh, microbial systems. Uh, uh, the main one we're studying in Pseudom is Pseudomonas arginosa, the opportunistic pathogen. Uh, so we can do a lot of biophysical measurements, uh, and these biophysical measurements are really informing us about the, the physiology of the bacterium, and with that we can really answer the questions about, for example, the, 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 the dynamics of this pili, rather than focusing on, on the static structural aspect of it. So we can generate, to do this, we can generate mutants of the different pili components, for example. So mutants that cannot have the pilus only has the flagellum on ice cat picture. And a mutant that doesn't have the flagellum components only has the pili. Uh, we can measure their length. We can measure their numbers. I mean, this is just beautiful. It's, it's opening a, a, another dimension in the way we're studying these microbes. Uh, what we actually, uh, uh, the added value of iScan, not only in just counting, is that we have three-dimensional in, uh, information from the pictures. So it's interferometric in, in, in nature. Uh, therefore, you can actually interpret the changes in contrast on, on the picture as uh, some information on the position of these structures. So for example, uh, a pilus that extends from the cell surface and that looks uh, like it has a uniform dark contrast here uh, is, is a coming from a pilus that's actually a, under tension and flat against the surface, so uniform contrast, therefore uniform uh, 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 Z position. Uh, when we have alternative black-white, black contrast along a line, that means that the pilus is at an angle, uh, so we can actually uh, assume that it is some sort, some sort of position. And then we have more complex shapes that have uh, more complex contrast changes. It's hard to infer exactly what the position would be. But supposedly, we know the relationship between the contrast change, the polarity change in the signal, and the, the, the change in height of the, of the sample. Uh, so using some smart calibration, we could actually really uh, uh, figure out what the real position of the pilots would be in any different configuration. So we use this to actually track the movement of this pili. Uh, this is one example of a movie that doesn't play. Uh, but what you can see in this pili is that they're actually uh, retracting very quickly. So uh, it's flopping at the beginning of the movie and then becoming dark. We play this in slow motion. In slow motion, you can really see the pilus being floppy around the cell. So this one here, uh, it's changing contrast quite a lot. And, have, and then there's a little dot that appears. It means that's the attachment of the cell. And then it becomes all dark. And this is actually a very important event in the process of uh, type 4 pili uh, dynamics. And we thought that with this type of movies, we could actually time and really look at the sequence of events from extension, attachment, retraction, and tension, and even detachment. So with this, we were able to actually combine this, this, this ISCAD visualization with uh, uh, mutations in the different components of the pillars. Uh, don't worry too much about the details of what the gene uh, we are mutating here. The most important one is the one on the right. Uh, we have a mutant that cannot retract the pillars. Uh, and we're measuring different aspects of the, the, the pilus extension and retraction. For example, here we're measuring the dwell time, how long the pilus is staying on the surface. Uh, and uh, we can do this from the attachment point here in dark contrast all the way to the time where we don't see it anymore. And a pilus that cannot actually, we found that the pilus that cannot retract actually doesn't stay on the surface for a long time. So this was the, 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 the first uh, consequences of this. So maybe it forms a catch bond. I'm not going to go into the details. The other aspect is that we found that the, 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 by timing the difference between attachment of the tip and tension, so really seeing this dark line, we found that the, the pili are really retracting within 100 milliseconds after they touch the surface. This really told us that maybe the pili are actually being uh, uh, stimulated by tip contact with the surface which was a very long-standing hypothesis in the field, which would, uh, we could actually ultimately test by looking at how often the pili are actually retracting upon surface contact, so when we see this black dot on the ISCAT picture, or when they're flopping around in the, in the, in the fluid, which we see as, as large fluctuations of the contrast. And turns out that the pili almost never retract when, uh, the, the, when they're really flopping and fluctuating around, and almost always retract after they attach. Uh, and so it turns out that I think uh, uh, what our results are, are show is that the contact is really a signal for retraction and that the type 4 pili movement are really coordinated with this surface contact event, uh, which is reminiscent of mechanosensing in a way. Um, 
So following up on this, uh, we wanted to know what happens with many pili on this movie I showed you a little earlier. So it's easy to understand that if you have one pilus, you extend it, you it attaches and you retract it to pull yourself forward once. But in this context of surface motility, you have actually very many uh, uh, events of pili extension retraction because the pili are not long enough to uh, generate displacement over many micrometers. So what happens when you have many pili? Do they actually uh, go always in the same direction or are they distributed on both sides and do the cells pull themselves back and forth? So we, uh, we knew about uh, a system that might actually affect the motility and regulate the motility of this uh, bacterium on the surface. And it's actually a mechanosensitive system that we actually described before. Uh, it's called the CHIP system. For those on you, of you who know about chemotaxis in E. coli, it's very similar to the chemotaxis system of E. coli. And we thought it could be a regulator of this motility by actually affecting the distribution of pili. I'm not going to go into the details of the system at all. Uh, what I want to say is that we could never demonstrate this uh, before we had IceCat because we couldn't see uh, pili uh, without disrupting them. So what we could do with IceCat was to actually measure the, the, the asymmetry of different mutants in pili distribution. For example, whether the, the cells tend to have pili on both poles or only at one pole. So this is an example for four pili. Uh, so we tend to have in some of these mutants pili that are more symmetric, pili distributions that are more symmetric, and pili that are distributions that are more asymmetric. And we could demonstrate that this mechanosensory system is actually regulating where the pili go inside the cell, so their polarity, and ultimately this affects where cells go. And this was consistent with visualization of movements, so these mutants actually either go in wild type, they go in straight directions, and in some of these mutants, they always go back and forth because of their pili are symmetrically distributed. Okay, and then we went even further by uh, trying to look at what's happening inside the cell and how this mechanosensory af system affects the molecular motor. So to do this, we can generate GFP fusion, uh, native GFP fusions to many of the molecular motors, uh, including this extension and retraction motor. With IceCat, we can actually do Correlative IceCAT, where we look at the pili and at the same time look at the distribution of the molecular motors inside the cell using fluorescence. Uh, so it's all built in on the same microscope, so it's simultaneous and dynamic. And this is very nice because we could actually demonstrate with this uh, that there's a strong correlation between the localization of the extension motor, so the, the motor that polymerizes these monomer subunits, and the, 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 the pili. Whereas the retraction motor, the cells doesn't really care where it puts them. It actually puts them at both poles at the same time, irrespective of the number of pili. So they seem to be constitutively active. So ultimately, what matters is the localization of the, the, the extension motor, and the cells will polarize in that direction. OK, so ultimately, we have a system. ISCAT really allowed us to, to, uh, to, the, to understand this mechanosensitive system and how it polarizes the cells in response to mechanical stimuli. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this. This is published, so you can actually look at the model on, on, in the paper. Uh, what I want to say is that on the biological standpoint, this mechanosensory system makes bacterial locomotion look like very much like human locomotion, where we use mechanical cues, actually, and not necessarily visual cues to actually guide our, our, our locomotion, for example, our gait, at the single limb level or at the multiple limb level. And I want to conclude with the opportunities in IceCAT. So we, there's still a lot of progress to be made and many opportunities, both at the hardware and software side. So I really encourage everyone to actually look into this. Uh, we're very happy to collaborate with uh, many people who are interested in automation or improving the, the, the optics and also the, the image analysis aspects. Uh, and with this, I'd like to thank uh, my lab, Lorenzo and Marco, for doing some of the microbiology and the optics that we actually uh, did in the lab for ISCAT. Uh, the collaboration of Philippe Kukura and his lab with uh, his student, Adam Feinberg, and the funding sources. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for the interesting talk. And uh, maybe a quick question, if anyone wants to ask? OK, well, here. Two, two, quick, two quick questions. So the first one, uh, do I understand correctly that the uh, lateral resolution of IceCAT is just a normal diffraction yeah, it's resolution? Just, then, yes. So it's kind of 200 nanometers yes. or something like that. Yeah. Then, 
the other issue, I, unfortunately, your 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 presentation disappeared. Uh, but one of the last images, what you showed about bacteria. I mean, could we go back something like three slides? One uh, and here, known uh, forward. Here, 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 here. Yep. Uh, you, ha you, you, you show this image of this correlative ice cat fluorescence and yep. so on. And I'm wondering because um, on the on the on the signal, I mean, you interpreted these these dark and bright spots and so on, like like spatial information about the conform how the how yes how, the, the how these filaments lie on the surface, and I am seeing kind of stripes. Oh, the stripes uh, are, we have many artifacts. There and, and, and those correlate actually with your signal. No, there are some artifacts from the, from the imaging and the scanning aspect of the, of the, of the AODs. Uh, we, depends on the day because this is very, uh, affected, very much affected by the, by the position of the cover slip. I mean, it's such a sensitive technique. Okay. Uh, but usually we try to correct for this. Very good. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.